seem like my work. They seem a little cold and inert. And, and if all my works, I'm trying to get multiple levels simultaneously hitting you. If it's a portrait sculpture, the features of the sitter, then there's the color of the stone. Then there's what I do with the robot on top of that. And then I would put sometimes Victorian floral relief over the top of that. Uh, and then there's the venation of the stone. I'm trying to like make it so suffused with information that it's suffocatingly dense that you, you can't tell. Uh, people tell me sometimes my work look like they're like a hologram because there, there's almost too much to take in at once. And to me, that's the essence of a real object in the real world that can't be reproduced. That's kind of what I'm, I'm aiming for is something that requires direct experience. And, and and not a simple one time get. I mean, we all love pop art and punk rock, and it's all about mm -hmm. super direct and is what it is. I I tend to really like layered conceptually, um, uh, iconographically, uh, you know, technique wise works from the past. This richness that you know is a hard one and that you know, hits you on many levels and many different days in different ways. Uh, to me, that's the definition of a great work of art is that incredible complexity that I'm shooting for, I hope, and maybe achieve every once in a while. So, yeah, you know, it's funny, you, you, t you speak of the scholar stones. And if you'd asked me two or three years ago, what a scholar stone was, I would have drawn a total blank. But there was this incredibly popular movie from Korea just uh, a year and a half ago, uh, Parasite. And the whole yeah. plot of the movie kind of pivots on the scholar stone. It, they kind of have to explain to you what it is, you know, as part of the plot. And so let me ask well, you. Yeah. Artists love them, too. <laughs> yeah, so. Sure. Well, I mean, it seems, you know, kind of tied to the like the whole concept of like a bonsai tree, right? Maybe there's a little yep. bit more manual manipulation in creating a bonsai. But it's this same thought of having this imaginary, unexpected juxtaposition of scale, right? Your work is obviously paying homage to historic masterpieces. Can you talk to, you know, kind of the history of artists being in dialogue with the artwork that comes before them and how you're continuing that long history of being in dialogue? Uh, sure. Well, I mean, I remember in Jansen's art history, they almost um, started big... Uh, chapters, big sections of the book with, um, I think it was like Montaigne's take on Durer and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Picasso's take on earlier artists. I mean, that's a classic student exercise just to copy from the masters. I mean, you go to the Metropolitan Museum today, you got people with easels painting, uh, you know, so uh, it's one more instance where the, uh, advances in technology gave me the ability to, I thought, uh, get just the facts from the big, from the get go. When one artist is doing his take on another, there's interpretation, uh, in the traditional way of doing it. I mean, there's uh, they show, uh, Michelangelo's earliest work. It's, I, it's in, um, come on, it's in Fort Worth, uh, at the, um, come on, the Lewis Kahn building. Yeah. Uh, at the, at the, the Kimball. At the Kimball. Yeah, it came to New York. It's a, it's after Martin Schoengauer, mm -hmm. The Temptation of St. Anthony, and the young Michelangelo, I think when he was like 13, uh, did this take on it, but it was colored, it wasn't an etching, and it was, you know, he's already trying to assert himself, and the changes were subtle but significant. And uh, to me, I mean, one goal has been to keep all the power of the historical works I'm working with, but take them to a new place. And 
I don't like jokes. Can I say that I, when I say a Saturday Night Live episode from my college days, when I thought those things were so hilarious, they fall flat. <laughs> Humor doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work so well anymore. They all look like they're overacting and, you know, Steve right. Martin or Dan Eckwood. And I'm going, yeah, that's, boy, that, that was funny. I, I can't believe that. But, uh, you know, artist gestures that are one line humorous things. I mean, I'm not going to name any names, but if you put yourself in the lap of, uh, the Virgin and make a Pieta, or if you put high heels on a Bocconi and so on, you know, I'm going, ha ha, that's, a, that's like not, again, that complexity I'm looking for. I'm, I'm looking for l- introducing lots of subtle changes to, and this is controversial with art historians I've talked to, perfect them. And uh, here's news for you, art historians. The Romans were not that great. They made a lot of errors. Donatello, I'm working with him right now. Oh, my God. Uh, formally and you know figuratively, they don't even make sense. Uh, <laughs> legs kind of stop and then <laughs> exit at another point. And uh, I mean, the Romans didn't carve the backside of the sleeping hermaphrodite's face, and so I'm doing that. I'm I'm trying to kind of take them to a place that those artists who did a fantastic job, especially given the technology that they had to work with in their time, I'm trying to take it to a place they would have gone in their dreams almost. I mean, the Bocconi that I work with, the uh, you know, unique forms of continuity in space, Bocconi never had money to make a bronze in his lifetime. That one at MoMA is 20-something years posthumous. The one at the Met's a horror show made by the family of Marinetti, the, the you know, the, <laughs> the rabble-rouser of futurism, uh, bad fabrication. I mean, to me, that that's an interesting thing. There's no real original because... <laughs> He never had time to make one, and I'm I'm thinking the whole time of Bocconi, who was an amazing sculptor, would be considered the equal of Picasso and all the early 20th century sculptors. If he had been able to realize his work in permanent materials, they all got lost and washed away. He got dragged to death by a horse in World War One, and they were kind of lost, and we only had a couple plasters. And so there's that weird exhumation thing that I'm doing. But I'm also picking subjects I think they're a little less familiar. I didn't work with Michelangelo's Pietà in Rome. I worked with strange historical subjects that maybe are less well-known. It gives me a little bit of room to run to get away from the stereotypes that accompany the more well-known ones. So, Do you think you'll ever feel inclined to do something far more contemporary? So, For example, I came across a video of you online visiting the Ferrari headquarters in Italy. Would you contemplate creating a Dino out of Rouge de Bois? Well, not, not that one, but... Uh... Yeah, Flavio Manzoni, the design director there, it turned out liked my work and he invited me to come down. And it's this weird thing that uh, my, uh, you know, I didn't have many opportunities to be inspired visually as a kid, but we always took our vacations in Palm Springs at the off season rates in the middle of August uh, for like three days at a motel. It's like 120 degrees and, uh, you know, but the, Modernist architecture there, and, and my first experience with uh, an it- Italian car was there in the 60s when I was like 12, and uh, it changed my life. Uh, my assistants were saying after that that visit, a couple went with me to, to the Ferrari factory. It's like, got the same stuff you were saying there as what you say at the studio. I mean, don't let the line stop moving. And, you know, da, 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 there's a flat spot on it. And I, I you know, I, I like imbibe that from Ferrari. So the fact that my work has of late had ancient historical sources is no indi- indication of where my work is going. It, uh, I started working with the Madarda Rosso project uh, because uh, the forms are on the verge of complete abstraction. Uh, the, I see that strain and the scholars' rocks coming together. And we have a big new development that we've been experimenting with for a long time now of blending multiple species of stone where I'll be painting with them and I effectively painting with various colors and translucencies that's going to lead in a whole new way that may not even involve a scan at the, at the, at the base. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I keep saying I'm not one of those guys dressing up in the Civil War costume out, to, you know, uh, historically reenacting. I'm, right. you know, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I hope I'm, I'm 
in the middle of a critical enterprise here. And uh, don't mistake the ancient forms for some antiquarian endeavor. I, I don't know if you like people quoting you, your words back to you, Barry. But uh, uh, well, I, I don't know if I do. <laughs> okay, depends but, on what you're going to quote. Okay. Well, you know, it's it's from an artist talk, and and I, I thought it 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 kind of gets to a, a nugget of maybe who you are, and uh, I'm just going to read it here. It says, "I had okay. a I had a religious upbringing, a lot of right and wrong being true. This calling to be an artist wasn't about making presentations, making theater." It was about doing something really real and pursuing it to the maximum and inspiring people to work with me in that same way. And when I hear that, it sounds like at the core of your process and who you are, are things like integrity and leadership, a commitment to excellence. And you you really sound like a coach. What do you think? I... Uh... Well, it is important about uh, to me. I, I can't do anything I do now without this incredible team. So I'm always wondering what inspires these people. I mean, uh, probably most of them would like to be me or, you know, an artist having shows, supporting himself off his art. And I always say, you know, short of that, I want it to be the best job you could have in the art world so you know i built the new studio with a lot of thought to the the beauty of the spaces the creature comforts and when we have barbecues we've got uh, locker rooms with showers we've got uh, health plans we've got retirement plans i mean i'm trying to take care of these incredible people who work with me but also inspire them because uh Again, on their budgets, they could never work with the materials and the processes that we're, you know, we're utilizing. Uh, they um, have never done something that took a thousand or hours, let alone ten thousand hours, to make. And I'm always saying, you know, the look at the in the end, I, I've got my name on it. That's how the art world works. We all know that this is a team effort here, uh, and it's embarrassing. For me to have people walk through my studio and say I all the time. In fact, dealers have corrected me. Stop saying we. <laughs> they want to market the great genius <laughs> thing. And I'm, uh, you know, so I'm always thinking what motivates these people. And I'm, I mean, I have really high goals for for art. I I think of the Gothic cathedrals. I think of Ghiberti's Gates of Paradise. I think of incredible superhuman efforts that yield these drop your drawers, unbelievable achievements. Uh, and I, I kind of feel like I don't find that so much in the contemporary art world. Uh, you know, and I'm, uh, I'm really interested in that. I mean, my, I played classical piano. My kids played with a very intense Russian teacher. I remember she didn't know me and my work, but she said to me, uh, you know, about my kids, she goes, you give me 10 years and they can begin to have a creative thought. <laughs> and, y y you know, and I'm going, okay. And, and it's funny. I'm going, and you're talking to me about that. <laughs> I'm the guy who spent 10 years teaching myself how to make things. And, uh, uh you know, like, uh, I'm not worthy. <laughs> I felt like saying when I got to New York, I need to be worthy to compete with is the greatest things ever made. I mean, that's, that's a goal. I try to uh, uh, pass that on to people here. I have a well-known contemporary art supporter. He's a really good guy. And he sent me a, a contemporary relief, which I thought was kind of insipid and, uh, you know, by a super well-known artist. And I, he goes, Barry, what do you think of this? And I sent him back an image of uh, Ghiberti's Gates of Paradise. And he said to me, well, that's not fair. And I said, oh, it, the hell it isn't. I mean, isn't that supposed to be the goal? To, to, to do better than that, to at least be that good with a contemporary intent and content? I, I mean... To me, that that's that's what this is about, and I'll die trying. But I, you know, I've got to, I've got to inspire this group of people that work with me to to go for it, and they work in a way I know different than 
they do on their own work. I, I've told them all, I, I never want to visit your apartment. I'm sure half of you, you know, live with a messy place, you know? <laughs> but you all, you all stuck it up when you come here and work my way and the tools are all lined up. Tom Sachs calls it knowing, you know, they're all, you know, that's just to me satisfying as, as a whole picture of how you live your life and, and what you do, uh, you know, and so um, I hope that they take good things away from it, not just 